Signals Among the Noise For over 70 years, rumors have abounded regarding the discovery of materials of potentially alien origin, chiefly by the US government. This came mostly in the form of hearsay, stories from people often now long dead of the Roswell incident and others that verification of was woefully absent. Recent events have moved it closer to at least the possibility that within all of this, there is a kernel of truth, a something rather than a nothing being here. Just what that entails has been the subject of both much debate, but also much taboo. Dr. J. Allen Hynek once summed up the hard skeptic position as it can't be, therefore it isn't. But on the opposite end would be the true believer, and the positions that go along with that. But the fact remains there are plausible ways, or at least marginally so, for an alien presence in the solar system. And there was also a bias present within science against close aliens. We could talk of von Neumann probes in the solar system propagating and self-replicating across the galaxy in only a few million years. But as Aero director Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick pointed out recently, the plausibility seems to stop at the orbit of Mars. Anything inside that radius, or in the Earth's atmosphere, became implausible wrongly because of the taboo which led to a bias. But when you look at John von Neumann's concept, it has no such limitation. If you have a probe in the solar system, it's really no different from having it in the atmosphere of the most interesting planet in the solar system. With recent events, and the ongoing fight over legislation sponsored by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to get to the bottom of these rumors, the subject is starting to get the attention of the scientific community at large, so long as evidence is presented that we can actually reliably study, keeping a skeptical eye in mind. With that legislation, that may actually be on the table, if there is indeed a signal among the noise. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Colm Kelleher. Colm A. Kelleher, PhD, is a biochemist with a 15-year research career in cell and molecular biology. Following his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Dublin, Trinity College, in 1983, Kelleher worked at the Ontario Cancer Institute, the Terry Fox Cancer Research Laboratory, and the National Jewish Centre for Immunology and Respiratory Medicine. For the past eight years, he has worked as project manager and team leader at a private research institute using forensic science methodology to unravel scientific anomalies. Colm Keller, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Now, Doctor, we have grappled with the UFO phenomenon for over 70 years and, you know, before Roswell, really. And there's always been rumors and questions and everything else. But... It took a very different turn over the last few years where there seems to be something there in the U.S. government that at least knows more about this than what they're telling everybody else. Now, I wouldn't want to come to any sort of conclusions about it other than there just does seem to be a signal among the noise. Now, in your experience with the UFO phenomenon, looking at many, many different accounts and looking for patterns among these accounts and trying to glean what you can from the aggregate as opposed to the individual accounts, which can be problematic. But if you're looking at a lot of them, you can look for patterns. What were your conclusions on that? What did you see? Well, this I guess this goes back from I joined uh, National Institute for Discovery Science, which was an organization funded by Robert Bigelow back in 1996. We spent eight years focusing on the UFO phenomenon and investigating sort of boots on the ground, dozens and dozens of cases. And then we sort of moved into the OSAP program in 2008, which started through the Defense Intelligence Agency, $22 million program. We hired about 50 people in order to do that program. And the exclusive intent of that program was to investigate UFOs and also to determine whether or not UFOs constituted a threat to the United States. So I guess the, the short answer to your question is obviously we do have gobs and gobs of data regarding UFO performance. We have gobs of data regarding UFO technology 
and how, how and, and or or regarding technological performance what we don't have a lot of is what is the agenda there is definitely a technological a very highly adept technological force out there that has been interacting closely with humans for the last 70 75 years and if you look at Jacques Vallée's work, then you, you're really going back centuries and possibly beyond that. But regarding the agenda of the UFO phenomenon, we're still up in the air regarding agenda. But I will say that my experience that began with the National Institute for Discovery Science, investigating UFOs on Skinwalker Ranch and investigating UFOs out there, there is an element of deception that runs through the UFO phenomenon, in my experience, uh, uh, we were hunting something on Skinwalker Ranch that was definitely nuts and bolts UFOs cloaking a, a panoply of other very weird phenomena that seemed to go hand in hand with the nuts and bolts craft. So we are talking about deception. I think there's a thread of deception that runs through the entire interaction of the UFO phenomenon with humans going back to 1940s, 1950s, where observers were able to see nuts and bolts on objects, pretty, sometimes pretty close up, but they were never, there was never any interaction between these objects and humans. There was a lot of phases of this interaction with humans over the decades that includes everything from the so-called contactees in the 50s through the so-called abduction phenomena in the 1970s and 1980s. And if you look at the different patterns that emerge, you do see an element of deception. There is, There does seem to be a concerted effort on the part of this phenomenon to prevent accumulation of scientific data. A good example of that is right now on this planet, there are probably 6.4 billion smartphones, each one of which has a very high definition camera. A lot of them have high definition cameras, but yet we're still struggling with very blurry sort of long distance photographs. That should not be happening with something that is not actively preventing the accumulation of data. So I guess the short answer to your question is a technology that is engaging in deception. Is it possible, and this will go a little bit out there, but is it possible that it is a problem of perception? In other words, people might be seeing something that their brains can't understand, say something that's, you know, Carl Sagan once floated the idea, the idea of a tesseract, seeing things something in an upper dimension or whatever. And then it comes across to us as a, a phenomenon like this that doesn't make any sense or seems deceptive or something like that. Could it simply be that's the nature of it, that it what we see is, isn't what it actually is and that our brains are interpreting it, painting in. I think a, a large amount of what we see visually is, is the brain painting things in yeah. instead of, you know, what's actually there. It's, it's reconstructing. So is it possible that that's what this is, is a phenomenon of the brain? And to tie that in to the most disturbing aspect of the phenomenon, and honestly, the main reason I'm, I'm looking into it as a talk show host is injuries. There have been people injured by exposure to a UAP. Well, that opens up the question is what happens first, the injury or the sighting in those few seconds, and that they might not really be remembering what they actually saw, and it might have been something completely different than what's in our normal experience in life. I, I, I do tend to agree with you regarding human perception, which is at best imperfect and always has been imperfect. Eyewitness testimony, though, um, also has been used to convict a lot of people in, the, in courts over time. But from the point of view of human perception, I think there is sort of a, a group of people who are starting to really look at that from the point of view of, uh, of UFOs. And that would be people like Bernardo Castro, Donald Hoffman, Federico Fahin, the guy who actually invented the microprocessor at Intel, Jeffrey Kripal from Rice University, even Robert Lanza, who's a stem cell biologist. 
all of these people are basically saying that human perception is imperfect at best, but it's even worse than that, that there's a filter between what really is out there versus what we perceive. So, you know, that Bernardo Castro has this analogy of an airplane cockpit. You're, you're looking at the dials and the instruments of a, an airplane cockpit, and outside this airplane, there's a storm, a really heavy-duty storm brewing. And all human perception is, is really flying by these instruments in the cockpit. And the UFO phenomenon is obviously much more adept at understanding uh, human perception, or probably is much more adept at understanding human perception. And therefore, what we see is kind of only in relationship to a set of dials in a cockpit compared to what's happening with the UFO. So I think your, your question is right on there. But I think it's I, I think we're in a lot worse shape than a lot of people give it credit for, because I think the laws of physics are based on how we read these cockpit instruments. And the phenomenon seems to be able to come in, in and out of the cockpit, so to speak. Magnets on the compass. You can fool a compass with a magnet. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, this brings up the, the idea of, okay, well, you can't really at this point say this phenomenon is of alien origin, even though we'd like to. You know, that would be convenient. But maybe there is something out there that's weirder than aliens, something more elemental, something more that's, you know, been with us, that's a component to perhaps humanity itself. And that, again, you know, references uh, Jacques Vallée's work, because sometimes this looks a lot like folklore or whatever creates folklore. Let's put it that way. And I think I wonder if we're just seeing something that we've always seen that has recast itself as the UAP phenomenon and that it's something much, much older than that and something not of the nature. It's just that we currently have to happen to be thinking about aliens and SETI and things like that, when in fact this might be something else. Do, we, do you think that has legs, that this, this might be an evolving phenomenon? Yeah, I, 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 I'm obviously a great fan of Jacques Vallée. Jacques Vallée joined the uh, National Institute for Discovery Science Advisory Board in 1995, and I was hired at NIDS in 1996. So I've been, you know, it's almost like a sort of Valet has been almost like a mentor because over the years, you know, National Institute for Discovery Science was spending a lot of time and effort and money looking at the at the UFO phenomenon. But Jacques Valet was always a part of that. He was fundamental to a lot of the brainstorming that happened in 2008 at the very early stages of the OSAP program, the Advanced Aerospace Weapons Systems Application Program that began through the Defense Intelligence Agency in September of 2008. Valet was, was instrumental in designing the UFO database well, actually, it was a data warehouse that was used during the OSAP program, and the uh, the valet called it the Capella data warehouse. And that data warehouse was actually a compendium of multiple different databases, including the database from the National Institute for, for Discovery Science, which we had worked on for eight years. But it also had multiple pilot databases, you know, military pilots, civilian pilots, it, it had a really interesting database that was fundamentally focused on the entire Brazilian Colaris incidents that were very pertinent from a UFO medical injury perspective. So a lot of cases and a lot of testimony went into that Colaris databases. And then we also had multiple government, British government, French government, Brazilian government, went through the whole release process. So I guess over many, many years, Jacques Vallée has been instrumental. So a lot of his thinking has permeated through both the National Institute for Discovery Science and OSAP. So we have been very, I think, careful in sort of negotiating our way through the process of interpreting all of this data. And 
I'm very loath to go down the road of what is actually happening here. Are we talking about extraterrestrials? Are we talking about interdimensional phenomena? Are we talking about ultra terrestrials? Are we talking about sort of breakaway civilizations, the so-called crypto terrestrials or humans from the future? Ultimately, it's from a scientific perspective, it's incredibly difficult to distinguish between something like extraterrestrials from the very sparse data that we have versus interdimensionals, for example, or something even more exotic, as you're alluding to. I mean, fundamentally, from a scientific perspective, the, these, these kinds of distinguishing hallmarks are very, very few and far between. Do you think we have hope? In other words, with an even bigger data set and continued exploration of the data set we have, can we find out more? Absolutely. I, I, I would, yeah. How do we do it? Yeah. I think, you know, not to sort of toot my own horn, but I think the Advanced Aerospace Weapons Systems Application Program, the way it turned out in terms of how efficient it became over a 27-month period in terms of data collection, and also reaching out and establishing contacts was very, very efficient as a template for, I think, what, what a future UFO program could look like. Not only did the OSAP program get into collecting database, really getting, getting multiple databases together, but we also had multiple boots on the ground, people who were willing to go out and investigate cases sort of rapid reaction force. We teamed up with MUFON, an organization that has people in 50 separate states. And we were able to really sort of get into investigating multiple cases every month. And from establishing a template for a future UFO program, we think the OSAP program is probably a good candidate for doing that. We also had a lot of good people on board, physicists, biologists. We hired a bunch of database analysts. We had military intelligence people. We had counterintelligence people. We had retired police investigators. We even had a couple of MD PhDs on our staff that were specifically focused on these uh, medical injury cases. And we investigated a, a few medical injury cases during the OSAP program. But this was only a very short 27-month program. It was terminated at the Defense Intelligence Agency because basically I think they would not anticipate the level of the, the numbers of cases that would be investigated, but also the kinds of weird phenomena that were coming up as we followed the data. Because once you start looking at effects of UFOs on humans, you start opening up things like medical injury cases, physiological effects, pathological effects, psychological effects, and even paranormal effects. And we did follow the data, and we followed the data down some pretty bizarre rabbit holes. And so ultimately, the program ended after 27 months. But if, if that program had continued for maybe five to 10 years and expanded according to what the program plan looked like at the very beginning of this whole exercise, I think we would be a lot further along this sort of investigation. Where do we go next? In other words, say, all right, let me ask you this first. Do you think Arrow is, is set up in the same way as OSAP? Do you think Arrow has any hope of, of furthering this or is it just, a, is it another blue book or something like that versus OSAP actually proactively looking into this with a, a, you know, a rigorous scientific method? Well, Arrow was set up under the auspices of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. And it, and it is that particular organization in the Pentagon is not known for being proactive in terms of a level of interest in the UFO phenomenon. They're, they tend to be not very proactive and not very aggressive in going after data. So that has changed somewhat in the last six to 12 months when it became under the purview of the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks. 
I think since then, progress has been made. Dr. Sean Fitzpatrick is now leaving by the end of the year. There will be new leadership in Arrow. But, you know, fundamentally, it depends on a number of internal champions within the organization that are really wish- willing and able to push the envelope. I think Arrow will collect some interesting data from the classified sensors, and that data will never be released to the public. But whether or not they will actually take the extra step and go where OSAP went, which is two separate lines in the water, the the first line being looking at UFO performance. And yes, Arrow has that covered in terms of a battery of highly classified sensors But the second aspect is looking into effects of UFOs on humans. And that's where it gets very, very messy, where you're going to get a lot of bureaucrats at the USDI and in the Pentagon saying that all of these studies lie outside the purview of the Department of Defense, that some other organization should be studying it. But the problem is, if you ignore effects of UFOs on humans, you're ignoring a pretty substantial part of the picture. And I guess that's where we believe that the OSAP program really did sort of shine because we were able to run both the so-called nuts and bolts investigations of UFOs in parallel with effects of UFOs on humans. And in order to study the entire UFO phenomenon, I do believe that you've got to do both. Views on private scientific probes into UFOs, and we have quite a few of them now. There's the Galileo Project, and we've got Gary Nolan at Stanford looking into the injuries and things like that. Do you think more fruit will come of that than trying to slam the government back into looking into this? Well, you know, one of the, I think one of the sort of the strengths of the OSAP program was the the ability of the United States government to contract out. So if there was some kind of a hybrid where Arrow was able to work much more closely with private organizations in sort of 100% collaborative capacity, sort of like the the model that NASA and SpaceX engineered this public-private sector collaborative framework that was very successful with NASA and SpaceX. If something like that could be engineered over time with Arrow and some of these private organizations, I think something could come out of it because there is flexibility and innovation in the private sector that is just very, very difficult to replicate when you're 100% focused at the Pentagon. Now you worked in your newest book, Inside the U.S. Government Covert UFO Program, Initial Revelations with Dr. Lakatsky. Right. And he said recently that he'd seen the craft and seen the inside of it. What are your thoughts on this? Can you shed any light on that or is it just off limits? Well, I do know that when we were preparing this manuscript and that section of the manuscript was sort of front and center and we discussed it a lot, we submitted this manuscript to the Defense Office of Pre-Publication and Security basically for permission to publish what was in it. And we were surprised what Dr. Lekaski alluded to in terms of the this technology of unknown origin actually survived the review process. But it was pretty obvious from the conversations that were happening at Dopser that none of the authors were permitted to go beyond what those statements were in the, uh, in the book. So what Dr. Lekaski had put out was about as far as he could go and about as far as Dobser was prepared to go. The, the previous book we put out, which was also on this program, but it was focused on, on the effects of UFOs on, on people, which was Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, we went through the same process with Dobser and Dobser really hacked this, hacked that book up because there was a lot of cases that we described that that involved people who were still active duty military. So there was a lot of changes that were made with the Skinwalkers at the Pentagon book. Not so many changes in the initial revelations book that, that came out about a month ago, but in terms of what we can say 
going beyond what Lukasky had written in that book, I'm not at liberty to go beyond what was written in the book. A tale of two cases, two particularly compelling ones, one semi-old, one semi-new, <laughs> both neither brand new. The first is the RB57 case of made initially probably most known through the work of Dr. James E. McDonald, who was an atmospheric scientist looking into UAP. And that particular case was multiple witness and multiple sensor for its time. Could you give us an overview of this case? Well, yeah, that actually was one of the cases that we put in as a really good demonstration of what UFOs performance looked like all the way back in the 1950s. I believe it was 1957, but it was this RB-47 aircraft from the United States Air Force was equipped with electronic countermeasures gear. And I believe there were six crew members and they were followed by a UFO for a distance of well over 700 miles. And so this was not a couple of minutes. This event actually lasted for 1.5 hours as it flew over Mississippi and then into Louisiana and Texas and into Oklahoma. And so the bottom line here is that both the cockpit crew saw the object visually and also it was followed by several ground-based radars. It was detected by the electronic countermeasures equipment on the RB-47. And so here we have ground-based radar, we have multiple crew members visually seeing this, and then we had a battery of electric countermeasure ECM equipment that was tracking this object. And one of the studies that I saw on the RB-47 case was that this thing was emitting something in the kilowatt range. This UFO was emitting probably maybe microwaves in the kilowatt range, but electromagnetic radiation was picked up beautifully by the ECM detection system. So this was a case that was kind of made in heaven for, you know, all the way back in the 1950s for how a UFO performance exceeded anything that we had at the time. So the RB-47 case was also investigated by a guy called Brad Sparks from the, I, he was associated for a long time with the Sign Historical Group which are sort of one of the preeminent historian-based groups that have been looking into UFO performance and UFO cases for a very long time. But Brad Sparks published a lot of data on this RB-47 case. We would see it as being one of these sort of uh, stellar, well-documented cases that go back all the way into the 1950s. And the reason that our book, you know, Initial Revelations, focused on the, some of these early cases is that it was pretty obvious we're not talking about Chinese drones here. We're not talking about Russian sort of countermeasures. These are sort of UFOs uh, that were documented a long time before the advent of Chinese balloons. Patterns. So also during the 1950s and 1960s, people talked about flying propane tanks. And these look suspiciously like the 2004 Nimitz Tic Tac and that we just culturally call it a Tic Tac today when back then they would have equated it to a propane tank yeah or or a septic tank <laughs> that you don't hear that one much but the idea of patterns again comes up here because you 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 know Tic Tac versus a propane tank sounds like a very similar craft now, can you connect those cases together with the Nimitz event as a modern, you know, a, a modern example of this versus what was seen in the 1950s? Well, I think you're right. There was a, a whole plethora of cylindrical shaped objects and yeah, flying propane tanks uh, were, were relatively common. Yeah, I, I think we may be victims of terminology here because what Commander David Fravor described was something that was about the size of a Hawker Harrier, which was about 46 feet long, and it looked like a, a very large version of the Tic Tac, which is, it looks like a very white propane tank with no flight surfaces, no acceleration, no obvious propulsion mechanism 
And this thing, um, I mean, the, it, it's now a, a world class, probably is probably the best known UFO case in the world now. But this thing, just like the RB47 case back in the 1950s, was detected by multiple F-18 pilots off the USS Nimitz. And it was also detected by forward-looking infrared technology on the F-18s, as well as the USS Princeton had state-of-the-art Aegis radar systems that were also detecting these. And by the way, these objects were coming in on ballistic missile trajectories, coming in at 80,000 feet, being tracked day after day after day by the USS Princeton. And finally, they vectored these F-18s over to investigate probably on day four or five. I'm not sure exactly which day it was, but bottom line was that the Commander Fravor's F-18 that went down to engage with this Tic Tac object was left basically flat because this thing accelerated from a stationary position close to the, not that far from the water, to a position that was over 20 miles away and within a, a couple of seconds. And then a subsequent F-18 that was launched and vectored in did manage to capture some forward-looking infrared data on, on, the, on this Tic Tac. So the performance of this thing was pretty mind-blowing. And it did happen to be one of the first cases that the OSAP program investigated because just as I was gearing up for hiring a whole bunch of people for the OSAP program back in November of 2008, a guy walked into my office interviewing for the program manager position. And this guy was a retired lieutenant colonel who, at the end of the interview, he told me that he was part of the F-18 group that was flying off the USS Nimitz in 2004. And he was part of this Tic Tac case. So the OSAP program were, were sort of in this position back in November of 2008, where we were essentially one of the few dozen people on the planet who knew about this case. And so, you know, one of the first things that myself and Robert Bigelow did once we heard this testimony from the retired Lieutenant Colonel was uh, we called Lekatsky in on the East Coast and he put together a team with a, a guy we called Axelrod that investigated the Nimitz case all the way back in uh, 2008. Uh, late 2008 and going into 2009, a report of this case was submitted to the Defense Intelligence Agency as part of the OSAP contract in July of 2009. And sort of eight years later, the New York Times broke the story and the, the, the case became global. But for that few years, there was probably only a few dozen people who knew about this case and just like the RB47 case, I think it's one of these sort of stellar uh, cases with top quality, highly trained observers, in addition to multiple separate sensor systems that were able to triangulate the UFO performance. How could these things be working to produce the effect that was seen by Fravor and other pilots and quite a number of people from the Nimitz have come out now that might explain how these things operate? I mean, can we, through dirts and things like that, can we try to envision how these things are working based on their flight characteristics? Well, one of the things that we were attempting to do with the OSAP program was what we call project physics. and. Actually, Project Physics is the sort of the guts, the heart and soul of this book, Initial Revelations. But Project Physics essentially contracted with 37, 38 separate people who were out in the private sector or who were working for major aerospace corporations or research institutes, universities. And the object of this thing was to essentially forecast 50 years from where we are now, or actually 50 years from where we were back in 2008, and project into the future about what technology would look like, what technology would look like 50 years from now, and keep it in the sane arena rather than sort of intense speculation. So Project Physics gathered all of these 
defense and uh, which were eventually published as defense intelligence research documents and they investigated things like a hypersonic performance they investigated things what what would the cockpit of the future look like faster than light travel would would wormholes going through wormholes would that sort of be a way for aerospace technology to evolve into 40 or 50 years from now so the 37 papers were 38 papers were published on the JWIX network which is the top secret TSSCI network at, uh, at the Pentagon and the the purpose of this whole thing was to establish a baseline of what UFO performance would look like in project physics and how that might match against what was being assembled through a database. Now, like I said, the 27 month period of the OSAP program was pretty truncated compared to what was originally planned to do. And the object of project physics was to see how close the delta was between what could be envisioned 40, 50 years out by the brightest minds and the best of the best versus what could be observed with the, you know, UFO performance. And, you know, the, the sort of six observables of UFO performance were that were sort of gleaned from the, the databases was the instantaneous apparent accelerations, 90 degree turns, hypersonic velocities that really almost never produce signatures. So, I mean, these were without signatures, low observability and the ability to cloak what looked like UFOs disappearing. Transmedium uh, travel has become the buzzword in the last uh, three or four years and the ability of an object to come out of the water and uh, go through the air and then move into low Earth orbit and also what, what looked like some kind of positive lift, the ability to, which involved transmedium travel also. So these observables were basically documented in the databases and Project Physics was attempting to provide the least possible delta between what was envisaged with the best of the best in terms of technology versus UFO performance. So. If the OSAP program had been allowed to continue beyond the 27 months and maybe into five years and 10 years, we could have got an answer in terms of closing that gap between the observables versus what these projections look like. But even as standalone topics and white papers, these 38 papers got an enormous amount of positive feedback when they were published on the JWIX network and they got less of a, an enthusiastic reception when they were published out in the public because a lot of people thought they were just kind of, you know, blue sky stuff that really had no basis, but they were actually carefully thought out. Now, a serious question in regards to this. So we have had people from the Pentagon going up in front of Congress and testifying, high level people. and they seem to paint a one picture that well we we looked into this one time project blue book didn't find anything which everybody knows the problems with that that program but they don't seem to mesh with what osap did in other words surely they must know about valet's database which is classified but they have access to that surely they must know about the nimitz event surely they must know about a lot of things but the thing is, they don't seem to present, whenever you ask Pentagon officials, they don't seem to present a deep knowledge of the subject that they almost certainly have. And to make it even broader, if there is something here, an alien civilization's presence, that is the biggest national or global security threat ever to face humanity. Why do you think that is? Are they just saying, we can't do anything about this, so <laughs> downplay it. Or do you think that there's just some sort of cultural pro problem in the Pentagon that, that, you know, makes them downplay the potential of this? You know, the potential national or global security threat of the UFO phenomenon? Well, I think the Pentagon has been sort of operating in a sort of, I, I guess, a mode of secrecy since the very, very beginning. I mean, they, 
the the Roswell event happened in Roswell, New Mexico, back in in July of 1947. But it also happened in a an area of extremely high security in New Mexico, where a lot of the nuclear technology that was fundamental to the United States national security was right there. The place was crawling with Soviet spies back in in 1947. You know, Stalin wanted to get his hands on this technology, so. This so-called crash of Roswell happened right in an area and at a time where the only possible reaction was to classify it at the absolute highest levels to prevent sort of an army of foreign intelligence agencies from getting their hands on it. So the very genesis of the modern UFO era was a deep dive in terms of the Department of Defense into the classified arena. And uh, it has remained like that ever since. So I think you're absolutely correct. Decade after decade, all the way through the uh, Project Sign, Project Grudge, which which ended in sort of the, the late 1940s, it evolved into Project Blue Book, which ran for a dozen plus years and ended in 1969. But all of these were essentially public relations efforts on the part of the United States Air Force and the various intelligence agencies to absolutely downplay the importance of the UFO topic. So the Pentagon has had a long, long history of avoiding the UFO topic. And it's almost like they were they they've been on in autopilot for decade after decade where all of this material all of this evidence has been buried deep very very deeply and it has never seen the light of day for decade after decade and then in 2017 when the new york times broke the story december of 2017 new york times broke the story about our program the defense intelligence agency program plus the the Tic Tac case, it kind of blew this sort of complacent arena of secrecy. It blew it out of the water. And the years since then, you know, it's been sort of the Pentagon and the Department of Defense have been playing catch up with the events that have, have unfolded. You you had the UAP task force that was originated in the in the United States Navy that was around the 2018 timeframe, 2017 timeframe, I believe. And that was a really proactive scenario within the Department of the Navy where a lot of pilots were being interviewed regarding UFOs, but the UAP task force did not last very long. It was the leadership of the, of the UAPTF was disbanded pretty quickly because the Pentagon bureaucrats did not like what was happening in terms of the UFO topic itself starting to surface in the media, which is what they had been successful in burying the previous four or five decades before that. And then the genesis of the what the early version of AARO was a an organization called AOIMSG. As the Pentagon loves these acronyms, I can't even remember what the name AOIMSG, but it was formed as a follow-up to the UAPTF. And so AOIMSG was under the wing of the USDI, the Office of the USDI and, and Security, which is, as I mentioned earlier, is the exact opposite agency that you ever want to be involved with the UFO investigation because it will never happen because they've had decades of practice at slow walking and keeping it secret. And then AOI MSG evolved into AARO. So you've got a sort of a legacy of decades of secrecy where the real hardware is buried deep within the bowels of the Pentagon and deep within various aerospace contractors. And that's the way it has been for decades. So the idea of sort of waking up this slumbering beast, you know, which has, has sort of started to happen in the last six years, I think it's a very long, long-term project to actually have any kind of success because I think the Pentagon is used to you know, essentially blowing this UFO topic off. And the, the standard line from the Pentagon since the closure of Blue Book 
in 1969 has been that the United States does not investigate UFOs. It has no interest in UFOs. UFOs do not constitute a national security issue for the United States. Therefore, the public is invited to move on. There's nothing to see here. It can't possibly not <laughs> represent a national security threat, though. It's a, it would be, you know, putting your hands to your ears and screaming, no, 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 no. But if there is, and this is hypothetical, and I'll go further than you, Elva, on this one, that if there is a presence of an alien civilization here, it is the worst possible calamity that the hum that human civilization has ever faced because the Fermi paradox reduces immediately to the zoo hypothesis. No matter what you do, they are in control. My question is, is why was this not taken more seriously before now in the halls of the Pentagon? Is it simply that they just had no way to counter it? It's advanced technology. It could be 2 million years more advanced than anything we have. Now, the question is, all right, so when we look at the alien option and that no matter the option, if you look at if you look at paranormal options or whatever, what power do they have? Could they end the universe? <laughs> Could the simulation come to an end by their hand? You know, oh, these humans have gotten out of trouble. You know, they're getting, gotten into trouble and created nuclear weapons and everything. Must end. Boom. Done. Or the alien civilization is here to make sure that we never develop generalized artificial intelligence. They're police. Or worse, the idea that a von Neumann probe came here long ago and it is replicated and self-replicated, which effectively makes it a 3D printer. And it is now so corrupt from cosmic ray hits that it's behaving irrationally, which explains the irrational behavior of the phenomenon. Shouldn't we be looking into these ideas and discussing them somewhere, whether in, in the halls of government or in the halls of science and papers or whatever, where we look at the phenomenon as a true global or national security threat, that this could be very, very bad what we're living through? Well, I think the organizations like the Galileo Initiative, Gary Nolan, Saul Foundation, which had its, uh, its inaugural meeting there recently, I think there is a lot of really super talent in the private sector. I mean, a lot of people in Silicon Valley are getting very interested in this. I think uh, Avi Loeb's initiative has galvanized a lot of interest in the academic community. I think a AIAA has sort of taken the uh, the UFO topic under its wing. So the out in the, the scientific arena, I think movement is happening that has not happened in the history of the UFO phenomenon. The problem is the sort of entrenched decades long culture of secrecy that the Pentagon has gone with. And the bottom line is, I guess the Pentagon feels that since there has not been an overt attack on the United States by some outer force, therefore there is really no need to get their act together and to and you know get their ducks in a row. So the private, I think what's happening in the private sector and the academic community is far, far ahead of what's happening in the, the United States government. Now, the exception really to the rule is, is in the last couple of years, some of the congressional hearings have been pretty incendiary and they have shone a light on what's happening with AARO and with the Pentagon. And I think there is hope in terms of the congressional hearings that will happen again and again and again. I think there is a possibility that some kind of movement will happen in the Pentagon, but I'm not holding my breath. I've been looking at this phenomenon since the 90s, and I don't see an awful lot of hope right now. I think the existential aspect of the, of the phenomenon has been here for decades. And if you look at Jacques Vallée's books, probably millennia. So I don't think there's a particular crisis that has happened in the last few years that has not been here for an awful long time. But if it has, and this phenomenon, say the insane von Neumann 3D printer that had a mission to make contact, but we came 
along far too longer than its you know best by date <laughs> it's it's not behaving correctly it's trying to adhere to it you know and make first contact in a in an understandable way but it no longer is and it's just throwing out damaged stuff damaged programming damaged data and then I mean, could if we ever discovered that, and this idea of close techno signatures plays into this, game over because I, I mean, the thing could act like an alligator and, and just say, "Well, this isn't working," and suddenly we get EMP'd in the Stone Age into the Stone Age out of nowhere as we advance, or it starts dropping technology on the planet intentionally, recoveries, you know, Roswell, things like that, where it's saying. I am going to influence your technological development to my end, right? not your end, to my end. And maybe it's some lonely artificial intelligence created by an alien civilization a million or 10 million years ago that wants the aggregate collection of the biological experience of a species in the form of an AI. Do you think that that could be the source of the secrecy that they're like, wait a minute, they're progressively dropping technology, you know, first materials, you know, and David Grush has sort of suggested that the, the first recovery of, a, you know, any material from a UFO was empty <laughs> and it was just material science that you could do with it. But maybe it gets progressively more complex as time goes on until it leads you to the creation of a damaging artificial intelligence, general AI, that is able to be compatible with it and be its companion or something like that, but not us. And that is our extinction event. That is why I say this could be the greatest existential threat to humanity because we don't know any of the rules. We have nothing to go on. And it seems to me that we need to find out, right? Well, if that is the reason for the secrecy, that through the decades, a small number of people have been privy to information of that ilk, I think we are obviously in serious trouble. There, there are sort of snippets and hints of information that the, the, the real sort of the reality behind the UFO phenomenon is just too downright scary to really unleash on the, on the public. I've, I've heard that kind of scenario for a long time, but I've never seen any evidence for it. And the best way to wake up the Pentagon, if, 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 if that actually is happening, I believe that the private sector and the academic sector have a real sense of momentum now. And I, I think if there is a sort of a clock ticking and we have a sort of a damaged AI, uh, to use your, your scenario, that is, and, and time is ticking down, I think the fastest way of doing this would be a combination of pressure from academia, pressure from the private sector, and pressure from Congress. Otherwise, we're all doomed. Last question. Pressure from Congress, the Schumer Amendment. Do you think that's going to pass? Do you think that's going to do anything? Do you think there are loopholes that the powers that be might be able to continue to hide this and that we, we end up with another round of... of uh, more of the same where we're like, well, we hear these, you know, rumors and things, but they find ways around it. The lawyers find, you know, ways around it. And we, we never actually, actually see any kind of disclosure, even if we do have artifacts of unknown origin. Where are we headed? Well, I, I know for a fact that both Secretary of Defense Austin and also Congressman Mike Turner, who's Congressional District includes Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in, in Dayton, Ohio. Both of these gentlemen have been putting enormous pressure in the Senate and at, in Congress, essentially trying to reverse the teeth in the Schumer Amendment. And I am very, I guess, skeptical about whether or not that language will actually pass in the National Defense Authorization Act, because Congressman Mike Turner especially has been very vocal in trying to limit the number of congressional hearings that are, 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 uh, are going on. And I think it's kind of, there is a clock ticking. And I think the more Secretary of Defense Austin and Congressman Mike Turner put pressure on various congressional people, I think the, the chances of the National Defense Authorization Act with all of the amendments, including the Schumer Amendment, 
I don't see it surviving, to be honest. I, I, I think the, the knives are out and I think there's a lot of evidence that, that a lot of pressure has been exerted behind the scenes to try to stifle future congressional hearings. And, you know, there's a battle going on for the hearts and minds of, of the, the Senate and, and Senate staffers, because as you know, David Grush spent a lot of time, many, many, many hours briefing members of the staff people of the, of the Senate Armed Services Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee. So a lot of people are privy to a lot of what David Grush knew or knows. And so the sort of battle is on between the forces that want to stifle this and they're being led by Secretary of Defense Austin and Congressman Mike Turner versus Congressman Tim Burchett and his allies that are trying to increase the pace of congressional hearings and increase the amount of debriefings that are happening um, in various skiffs. Last question. And I know I said the last one was the last one, but one occurred to me, and I want to ask you in your capacity as a, a scientist, a doctor in biochemistry. So say we, they, towed out a frozen body, <laughs> you know, some kind of biological material. How do we determine that's of alien origin and not of some artificial origin, artificially created DNA or something like that, you know, a custom organism or, some, you know, something that might have been printed by a von Neumann probe? If we actually do get the goods and there actually is biological materials, which is one of David Grosh's claims, where do we start in the science of trying to figure out where that thing is from, if it exists? Well, I'm assuming that if this exists, that there's been a lot of a lot of work done already. But definitely from a biological perspective, you've got sort of frozen material that has uh, even the best the best preservation that exists will not preserve something perfectly decade after decade, you know, you've got liquid nitrogen options and you've got, got ways of freezing tissue and preserving tissue, but there's got to have been decay. So the, the, the idea that you can, you can certainly do DNA analysis and you can do a lot of biochemical analysis. You can do the usual cast of characters, but extrapolating from frozen specimens and from specimens without knowledge of what has been done before, I think is very, very precarious because, you know, the human genome is, we know the human genome is a tremendously flexible and from a biochemical perspective, a tremendously labile template from which to produce a lot. I mean, 3% of the human genome encodes protein. 97% of, of the genome encodes regulatory sequences and a lot of very sophisticated ways of producing epigenetics. So, I mean, it could be that the human genome is capable of producing either a gray alien or something that looks like a nine foot tall blonde. And the genome is, is, is that flexible and that capable. So I think a DNA analysis would be insufficient to get any kind of extrapolations going. And whether or not data has been collected, I think is a really important facet of this because if data has not been collected and properly stored for the kinds of analysis that would be needed now, I don't think we'd be able to distinguish between artificially generated, you know, life forms from, you know, humans from the future, for example. Could the message lay in the DNA? Because we're still just first broaching that whole subject of trying to figure out DNA. Yeah, I think the DNA would be insufficient to answer that question. Interesting. So no DNA study, right? Well, I mean, <laughs> Unless, you know, I, I, I can't remember who it was, was it uh, who, who actually sort of postulated that the, you know, the ultimate messages will lie in the DNA. It's wide open territory. 
Dr. Keller, thank you for joining us today. Everyone should check out Inside the U.S. Government Covert UFO Program, Initial Revelations by Dr. Lakatsky, Dr. Kelleher, and George Knapp. And I hope you'll rejoin us sometime in the future when we get more information. Hopefully we do. Thank you very much. It was a very stimulating conversation.